Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Carry On, brought to you by Nation's Finest, where our mission is to support America's military veterans and their families with a comprehensive approach to housing, health, and employment that helps them to achieve self-sufficiency and reach their full potential. If you or a veteran you know needs help, or if you'd like to make a donation, please visit nationsfinest.org or call 833-468-9676. Again, that's nationsfinest.org or call 833-468-9676. I'm your host, Mark Miller, Army Veteran and Communications Director for Nation's Finest. Our guest today, Patrick Nelson, is a U.S. Army veteran who served in the Army National Guard. Patrick was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart for his service, but like many other U.S. veterans, he found the transition to civilian life tough and battled with PTSD and survivor's guilt. Now, he focuses on helping others by telling his story and encouraging others to do the same. He is the founder of Loyalty Point Leadership, a leadership training and development consulting firm where he inspires others to be impactful leaders through his motivational speaking, leadership development, and consulting. Patrick is also an active volunteer with Tee It Up for the Troops, a veteran support organization that runs golf tournaments to help wounded warriors. Patrick Nelson, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Carry On. You're welcome, Mark. Great to be here. Well, really appreciate you being here. So, you know, we've heard your intro already, but could you tell us a little bit more about your military background and, and kind of what motivated you to get started with, uh, with your time in the Army National Guard? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined the, the Army National Guard in Minnesota when I was 17 years old. I was a junior in high school and I had a pretty tough childhood. Growing up, um, no biological father, I saw some drugs in the house. One day my mother was coming out of school, getting arrested, put in the back of a cop car. My stepsister committed suicide in rehab. I ran away from home, took my mom to court because I don't want to live there. It was a pretty tough childhood. Um, and I heard these a bunch of guys at my high school were talking about how they were going to Oklahoma for the summer. They had just joined the National Guard. And I was like, wait, if I join those, those I can get out of here, <laughs> get out of this small town in Minnesota for the entire summer? Sign me up. Um, and so just, uh, like two or three weeks after turning 17, I, I signed up. And so I went to basic training between my junior and my senior year of high school, came back and completed high school, barely graduated. And, uh, two days after graduation, went back to, uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma for my AIT advanced individual training. And, um, you know, I stumbled my way into a small community college in West Central Minnesota. I didn't have the type of family that took me on college visits or helped me fill out applications or financial aid forms. I had to do it all myself. And with no real direction, I started skipping classes that very first week. Um, I think it's safe to say as far as college was concerned, I was headed nowhere pretty fast. But then all of our lives changed, you know, that Tuesday morning in September 20 years ago. And I was in the third week of my first semester. And as I watched on TV, um, you know, the planes hitting the towers and the, and the Pentagon, I felt the same feelings that everybody else felt. I felt helplessness and sorrow and anger. And I knew at that time that, you know, the National Guard wasn't going to be the, the first ones to go. And I wasn't going anywhere in life in college. And I'm a, a young man. I wanted to, uh, to serve my country. So two days later, dropped out of college and went to the recruiter's office and, and went active duty army. Well, that all sounds pretty logical. I know so many in the military, you know, they thought the military was a good option because wherever they were at that point, clearly in your case, the military was, was a better place than where they were coming from. Right. Yep. So, so you've talked before about a life-changing event in, in 2005 that kind of altered the course of your future. Could, could you describe that and, and how that impacted you? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my service, I went on to become a paratrooper and I served in the historic 173rd Airborne Brigade based at Vicenza, Italy for almost seven years. And so we went to Iraq for 12 months, went to Afghanistan for 12 months, and then Afghanistan for 15 months on my last tour. But you're right, it was in 2005, it was the first tour in Afghanistan. 
And it was June 8th, 2005. We're operating out of a small Ford operating base near the Pakistani border. And uh, we're getting resupplied with some ammunition. Resupply procedures were a common part of our, our weekly work. Our platoon was divided into two sections. And um, a Chinook helicopter would come in and they, they'd come in with the ammunition, the supplies. And so our platoon, one of the, one of the sections are, in our platoon would be designated as the hot gun. So they basically had to stay out and ready to respond in case we came under attack. Well, the other section was tasked with unloading the supplies from the helicopter. And on this morning, my section was the hot gun. But the other section had a sergeant that was leaving to go on R&R. &R, so I was going to backfill his position and go out there. And, um, you know, as I heard the helicopter approaching, I hopped in a Humvee with my good friend Luke. And right before we drove out to the landing zone, my soldier, Emmanuel Hernandez, hopped in the back. Now, he's... He's supposed to be back with the hot gun. So I turned around and was going to yell at him to get out. But then I thought for a second that I value that kind of work ethic in my soldiers. You know, he wants to come with some heavy boxes and be a team player. That's great. I know our section will be fine without him. But then I noticed he didn't have his helmet on. And so I literally opened my mouth. But then I realized, well, I, I, I don't have mine on either. Kind of hard for me to say something if I'm not doing the right thing. So I didn't say anything. We got out to the landing zone, the helicopter landed, and a group of 10 of us stepped to the side of the aircraft so they could take a machine gun off the back ramp and we could start unloading it. And uh, my platoon sergeant handed me a piece of paper that had serial numbers to items we were expecting, basically telling me, hey, it's your responsibility to make sure that we get these specific items. And I grabbed that piece of paper from him and I began to ground guide my buddy Luke in the Humvee to get him a little bit closer to the back of the helicopter. And the next thing I just remember, it was just bam. And everything just went dark. And as I was laying on the ground, disoriented and unable to hear it, at first I thought maybe somebody just came up behind me and had, you know, hit me on the back of the head, horsing around or, you know, playing a joke that went too far. And, um, but then I looked up and there were bodies and blood all over the ground. And the helicopter powered down. My hearing quickly came back. And I heard that very distinct whistle of an incoming rocket. So I quickly got up. I dove underneath the Humvee for cover. Rockets started impacting all around. As I was laying there, I realized there was a rocket that landed next to us. And um, as that barrage finally ended, I crawled out from underneath the Humvee, started making my way back to the soldiers that were still on the ground, really unsure of what I was going to find. And as I was doing that, a Marine yelled from behind me that I'd been hit. Now, up until this point, Mark, I hadn't felt any pain, but I turned my head and I looked at the back of my uniform and it was shredded and blood was starting to pour. And it was at that moment that the pain just all of a sudden hit me. And the other soldiers quickly triaged those of us that were wounded, loaded us into whatever type of vehicle they could find and brought us to this small clinic on our base that was ran by an Afghan doctor. And my wounds were very, very minor compared to everybody else. I was peppered in the back with some shrapnel, some small holes, nothing too serious. And um, I was quickly bandaged up by Luke and I saw Sergeant Michael Kelly, a supply sergeant who had recently been attached to our unit. He's laying on this elevated stretcher off the ground and the Afghan doctor who worked in that clinic, who is like five feet, two inches tall, just you know, a short guy. And he's, he's standing on this red milk crate and he's doing CPR on Michael. And I did a quick lap around the clinic to see who else was hurt. Came across my platoon sergeant, the one who just gave me that piece of paper right before the explosion. The femoral artery in his leg was severed along with other severe wounds. By the time I came back around, it could have been more than 30 or 45 seconds, but they had lowered, lowered Michael to the ground and were zipping him up into a body bag. And I, I found my way into a small room in the back of the clinic where I found my soldier, Emmanuel Hernandez. He's laying on a table, unconscious, his head bandaged. But I could see his chest rise and fall. So I knew that he's breathing. And I, I just grabbed him by the hand and whispered to him that everything was going to be okay. And medevac helicopters arrived, brought us to forward surgical teams right throughout the country. Um, they removed several pieces of shrapnel from my back, but left a few souvenirs in there that were a little too deep to get out and stitched me up and bandaged me up, sent me back to the landing zone to get on another helicopter ride to Bagram Merrifield for some more advanced care. And... Um, you know, as I was waiting there, my commander approached to, to check in with me and see how I was doing. And I said, I'm going to be just fine. How's Emmanuel? And um, he said, he's going to be okay. And, 
you know, I felt the weight of the world just sort of lifted off my shoulders, felt such relief. And he turned to walk away and he got about four or five steps and he turned back around and with tears coming down both of his cheeks, he said, I'm sorry that I lied. Hernandez didn't make it. And my knees got weak. I hit the ground. My commander embraced me. And, um, you know, Emmanuel died because shrapnel from the explosion it hit him in the head. He died because I wasn't doing the right thing. Because I didn't have the courage to speak up and to say something. And, um, you know, I obviously beat myself up for a long time following that, um, including when I got out of the army, tried to drink my problems away, tried to wash them away with pills. And of course, none of that works, right? That, those only serve as accelerants for challenges I was already facing. But thankfully, over time, I've learned that I can take that story and, and um, you know, inspire others and influence the future. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And after hearing all that, I, I can definitely say we're, we're glad you're still with us today. And, uh, and we definitely don't forget those who didn't make it home. And that's why we all do what we do to help, help our fellow veterans who, who are still here. So thank you for sharing that. What a, what a traumatic experience. And it, and it sounds like it even took a while to process, even in the moment, to figure out what was going on and, and wrap your mind around everything there. It's not a surprise. It takes months, if not years, to, to still process all of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly something that I still deal with. I, I mean, I don't think there's a cure for, um, you know, a lot of the, the trauma that many of us have gone through, but it's something that I've learned how to live with. And, um, and even how to leverage could, because again, I obviously can't change the past. Nothing I do is going to bring Emmanuel or Michael back, but I've learned that, you know what, I can, I can honor their memory. I can honor their service and honor their sacrifice by telling their story and, um, and helping others learn more about them and, and, and the many others who, who sacrifice as well. That's a great way to look at it. And thank you so much for sharing their story and their memory with us here today. You're welcome. So let's jump a little bit further to your recovery. Yeah. As you were recovering, you got back into, you got back into school. What, what motivated you to continue your education and, and further your career? And, and while you were doing that, how did you balance that with still being a soldier in the guard? Yeah, so it, it, it was challenging. I always had the um, the dream of graduating from college, being the first one for my family to ever do so. And so actually, you know, it started after I got wounded. I was medevaced um, for three or four weeks back at Bagram Airfield. I was given the opportunity to go back to Italy and, and recuperate where I was stationed. But I was single at the time. Um, I didn't have anybody really waiting for me there. So I just I hung out at Bagram Airfield and, and, and healed up enough where I could get back out there with my soldiers. But I still couldn't go out on any missions. I couldn't wear body armor. I was still on pain pills. I was still stitched up. I really couldn't do a lot except be there. And we were very fortunate to be working with the Special Forces and Navy SEALs, which meant they had some pretty good budgets, which meant they had some nice satellites, and uh, which meant we had a pretty good internet connection. So me not really being able to do anything um, and at the urging of my platoon leader at the time, a gentleman by the name of John Post, I started plugging away at these online college classes. And so I ended up finishing two years of college between both of my Afghanistan deployments. Um, so the one where I was wounded and then the next one I was on, our platoon, we all pitched in and, and we bought this satellite for eight or 9,000 bucks so that we could have internet. We're, you know, we're literally kind of out in the middle of nowhere near the Pakistani border. Um, but we all chipped in and everybody had different reasons for wanting to get the Internet. Mine was I wanted to keep doing my college classes. So I finished two years of college while I was in the Army. And um, I was able to transition when I left the Army in December 2008, January 2009. I'm, I'm sitting in a college classroom um, going straight into my major and was fortunate to be able to go um, – to get a master's degree at that time and um, went back to school again a few years later and got another master's degree uh, in, a, in another field as well. And very fortunate to be able to do that. 
Wow. So you really took all that energy and just put it towards academics. Yeah. You know, I, I've always had that goal and it, it's amazing. I was never a stellar student by any means in high school. I'm not book smart. I mean, they've tested me. I don't have a high IQ, but it's amazing what you can do when you just do what the teacher tells you to do and you do the readings. And you know, when I got out of the army, I, I was 26, right? I've kind of got a lot of that going to college for the social experience out of my system while I was in the military. And so I did the readings, I did the work and um, I stayed focused. And it's, it's you know, when, when I got into the military, one of the best pieces of advice I got, they, they, you know, you, they said, in order to get promoted in the military, all I got to do is do what you're told, do what you're told, do what you're damn well told. And, uh, and, and I applied that into the civilian life with, with school. I did what I was told. I did the work. And uh, it's amazing what can happen when you do that, right? I, I was just going to say, that's a great message to all veterans out there, that if you're considering going back to school, uh, you know, a good two thirds, if not more of success at, at a university level is, can you follow instructions, which all of us yep. that have been in the military, we're, we're kind of good at that. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's great insight. And, and hopefully that motivates some who might be nervous about going back to school that, yeah, it can be tough, but uh, if you know how to follow instructions, that's that's more than half the battle. You'll, you'll do just fine. I mean, I literally got an A in every single college class I've ever taken except two. And again, it's not because I'm book smart. I'm not. I will admit it. Um, I, I like to think I have a high level of emotional intelligence, but um, just did what I was told to do, and uh, and it led to to some great things. That's terrific. And, and I'm so glad to hear about your success that you had in academia, which which I'm guessing, you know, has now led to your success overall. So so let's talk about that a little bit, given all that you experienced in your time in the military. And then there was kind of that crossover period where you were in the military and you were going to school. Now let's talk about your transition. How did that go for you where you transitioned out of the military to become pure civilian, just Patrick Nelson. Yeah, that transition was tough from soldier to civilian. Um, the one thing that served me best right away was I had a plan. I'd seen at that point so many people get out of the army and talk about doing things, but they didn't really have any plans put into motion. So I was still on my last deployment to Afghanistan, and this was six months before I even left the army where I had already signed a lease on an apartment. Um, I'd already been accepted into school. I had already been awarded a scholarship. I had things ready to go from the moment that I left the army um, that made it a lot easier. The biggest thing that I struggled with though was really trying to find a purpose again. You know, when I, I joined like so many people right after 9-11, signed up for all those patriotic reasons, but when, when you're in, Mark, is you know, it's you don't really think about that kind of stuff. It's just another job, honestly. Um, you may wake up a little bit earlier than than most people at their jobs and stay up a little bit later and might take longer than normal business trips. But uh, it was just another job for me. And it wasn't until I got out and I kind of become this lazy civilian again, I start reflecting back on my service and realizing I was part of something so much bigger than myself. How am I ever going to have a purpose again? And so I really struggled with trying to find out what that was. And initially I thought, you know, I'm going to go work in sports. I've got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in sport management, and I uh, went to work for the Minnesota Vikings in football operations at the time, my dream job with my hometown team. And uh, it was a great experience, but it didn't take me long to realize that's not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I ended up starting to do some speaking, just telling my story. A couple um, veteran-related nonprofits had asked me to sort of tell my story to some of their donors and um, yeah, had, had received some great feedback on that. And it was honestly very therapeutic for me at the time as well to tell my story. And I uh, started doing that more and more. And I uh, got connected with a, a leadership development firm and went to work for them for a little over five years, went back, got another master's degree from Pepperdine University in organization development. And then, uh, you know, February last year, went out on my own, started my own business, which, um, you know, February of 2020 is not a great time to start a new business. Um, but, uh, and it's been a challenge, but at the same time too, I'm a very optimistic person. 
I'm not the only one that's been impacted by uh, by this pandemic. And um, I'm very motivated to be successful. Well, and it, it sounds to me like you've lived through tougher. Yeah, I, I absolutely have. Again, it, it's it's pretty easy for me to keep things in perspective, especially because Unfortunately, there are a lot of veterans that are still struggling. As, as you guys know at Nation's Finest, um, with the great work that you all do, there's a lot of veterans that are struggling with some substance abuse problems, with employment challenges, um, a lot of veterans that are homeless. And uh, I, I feel that I am very, very fortunate for what I do have and overcome. You know, I was addicted to Vicodin and morphine for five years after I got out. I had a couple of surgeries related to my wounds. And... Um, and that was tough. Um, like I said earlier, especially with the, the the mental health challenges I was already facing at the time, it was a very difficult time for me. And at first, I, I had no idea I was even addicted. It was, uh, unfortunately, that was the the answer from the VA at the time for all the pain I, I had was they just kept sending me more pills and and I kept taking them. And, and I take 100% mm -hmm. accountability for it. And thankfully, uh, it only took five years, but realized, hey, this is a problem. And, um, yeah, I just went cold turkey on it. And it probably won't be how I'd recommend for a lot of people to do it. It, it was really tough. Um, nothing I, I would wish on anybody, but obviously thankful that I, I was able to do that and to overcome that. And really, the number one way that I've been able to do that, because I've always had people ask me, oh, what's the key to success? Is It's amazing what can happen when you surround yourself with the right people in life. And you know, not the people who are going to tell you what you want to hear, but what you really need to hear and people who have your best interests in mind. And I was very fortunate um, to be able to have some great people in my life when I transitioned from soldier to civilian that um, was able to identify some of the challenges that I was having that I didn't even know. It's a huge blind spot for me. Um, and especially my my girlfriend, who's, who's now my wife, um, being able to recognize a lot of that because I kept a lot of things hidden. I, I compartmentalized a lot of it. Um, I isolated a lot, which a lot of veterans do. I was emotionally numb to a lot of things, but um, it just took some time. And again, surrounding myself with those right people who did have my best interest in mind and wanted to see me succeed. They've been very helpful. That's terrific. And so glad that that support network is there for you and, and encourage others to find that support network for themselves as well. So you touched on something there in, in your last statements, talking about purpose. And it's a recurring theme I hear a lot. I know our counselors hear it a lot. And, and I've experienced it like you have. And we didn't, like you said, we didn't realize it when we were doing, we thought we were doing any other job. And every once in a while, you're like, wow, I'm here at the crux of where all this is happening. And I'm in the arena. And you get that surge of adrenaline. But then normally it is just a job. And you don't realize until you've left the military how much purpose we had back then. So I'm wondering if we could close today with your thoughts and your advice to our fellow veterans of how to deal with that loss of sense of purpose and also how to find it again. You've, you've found it by helping your fellow veterans telling their stories. I, I've found it by getting in, you know, doing very similar work, doing, mm -hmm. you know, working for a veteran nonprofit. So I'm curious, that, that's not the route for everybody. So what's right. your big picture advice for our fellow veterans out there that are that are trying to find that purpose again? Well, first of all, my number one piece of don't fret if you haven't found it yet. I didn't find it until I was 33 years old. Okay, this is especially my advice to, to those in high school and especially veterans transitioning out. If you don't know or you don't have it right away, that's okay. It's going to take some time. But find those things that give you energy, that make you feel different inside and, and pursue those and try to do those as much as possible. And yeah, there's, you know, you still got to pay the bills. You got to support your family. You've got obligations and stuff. You need to make money, but try to spend as much time doing those things that give you energy and that are just fun for you to do. And, and for me, it was, it's being on stage in front of people, sharing my story, sharing the story of other veterans and the service and sacrifice, educating the public on that. That's really what, what gives me purpose. And I've seen many veterans find it through many different avenues. Um, some have found it in, in starting their own business, uh, in clothing lines, in, in veteran-run coffee shops, in uh, taking care of animals. 
again, pursue those things that, that give you that kind of energy that just make you feel a little bit different. Where it doesn't feel like a job all the time. Again, we got those obligations that, that we have to meet. And maybe you're not able to find that through the job that's actually paying you, but seek out those opportunities, especially through volunteering. And for myself, it's it's with great veterans related organizations that keeps me engaged in the veteran community. That was something that I really isolated myself from when I got out. I didn't want to talk to anybody from the military. I, I didn't want anything to do with it at first. And, you know, the, the, they talk about the band of brothers and um, you know, how those we serve with become our family. And it really is true. And it was something that I, I missed quite a bit. And so just re-engaging with those organizations got me re-engaged with the veteran community and, and, uh, and I'm better off because of it. And, and you just ran from there doing, doing great things. Now, I think that's terrific advice that whether it's through your career or volunteer work to, to gravitate towards those things that energize you because we're not in the military anymore. We don't get orders. Hey, you're going over here now. Hey, this is your job now. Now we get to decide and, and that can be overwhelming, but you bring up such a great point that while it can be overwhelming, it's also so empowering that, that we can do the jobs we want. We can, we can volunteer in the places we want and, and we have the power to do that now. Yeah, absolutely. And and you have to be proactive about it, though. You can't just sit on your butt and think it's going to all of a sudden come to you or that phone's going to magically ring. You, you, you got to put some work in it. You got to get out there and you got to make it happen. Um, and veterans know what it's like to put in the work. We, we, we've done that. We've, we've, we've busted our backs doing the work. So we're no strangers to that. You got to get out there and you got to be proactive. Well, let's leave it with that today. Let's Remind our audience, get out there, be proactive in getting to the point where you can do those things that energize you. Patrick Nelson, thank you so much for all your advice today and, and sharing your insights and especially your story with us and, and the story of those who didn't come home with you. Thank you so much for honoring them in that way today. You're welcome, Mark. Thank you for, for what you're doing and the great people at Nation's Finest. Uh, it's, it's a great service and cause that um, people should definitely support. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. And thank you to all of you who joined us again today. We'll be back next week discussing issues relevant to veterans and those who care about them. Again, if you or a veteran you know needs help, or if you'd like to make a donation, please visit nationsfinest.org or call 833-468-9676. Thank you again for joining us today, and as always, carry on.